So there's a line through it. We'll be live in about uh, 30 seconds as I get our YouTube stream up and running. I'm going to have all the panel on mute while we get started, and then I can bring you in and unmute you as we start having a conversation. And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery Art Business Academy online critique group. Today is Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. Uh, it's good to be back here with you. We're running just a few seconds behind because I ran into some technical difficulties, um, which always seems to be the case when we're getting going, um, getting the video stream going. And then, of course, uh, my mouse battery died. So if you hear me scraping around, that's me working on the uh, trackpad on the laptop rather than being able to use my mouse, but we'll work our way through it. Um, it is always good to be back with you for another of these Wednesday sessions. I've really been enjoying um, the chance to get together and talk, look at each other's artwork and talk a little bit more about the art business. And uh, we're gonna do more of that today. Um, today's session um, is a, um, a, a critique. Last week was an Ask Me Anything, and this, this week we get to get back to the art. And our featured artist this, work, or this week is Carolyn Hancock. Um, Carolyn, it is a pleasure to have you here with us. Oh, it looks like I'm going to ask you to unmute, but you're going to have to unmute yourself. Uh, you should get a little pop up there. There we go. Good morning, Carolyn. How are you? Good morning. Thank you, Joe. Well, it's um, uh, great to get the chance to um, look at your work and get to know a little bit about you. Let's begin by um, with just a little bit of background. First, tell us where your studio is located, where you're coming to us from today. From Richmond, Texas, which is about 20 miles from Houston. So the greater Houston area. Houston area, excellent. And um, give us a little bit of background about yourself and um, your artwork, how you became interested in art and a little bit of your career. I, I love the intricacies of the face, um, how the light hits it, how all of the emotions go through the eyes and, and how it changes the face as, as a different emotion comes up, um, how just a little slight change in the lips will change the whole feeling of the, of the character that you're looking at. So I'm a portrait artist, a, a figurative artist. And um, how did you uh, first become interested in art? Um, well, there's a neat, a, a fun backstory to that. But it really boils down to, um, in 1994, my husband and I moved to Los Angeles. I knew that we'd have um, a year and a half, two years in, in LA. And for the first time in many, many years, I did not have to work. And I also knew that we would be moving out of the country. So after Los Angeles. So what was I gonna do with my time? I decided uh, to go on the art adventure and I took as many art classes as I could find in Los Angeles during that, during that year, we had a year and a half ultimately. And um, we, we noticed from your work that, uh, well, actually let's look at the work and then I'll ask you some questions about the work itself. Um, and we've got uh, five images here uh, of pieces that we'll be looking at. And the first thing um, 
I, I think that uh, obviously you've already mentioned you're doing figurative work and portraiture, um, and and um, uh, clearly that that's where your interest lies. The the second thing you notice is that you're working in pastel. What drew you to that medium? What was it about pastel that uh, that that took you in that direction? The the very first class that I had, I, I kind of stumbled into at the YMCA in, in Chattanooga. It happened, to, it just coincidentally happened to be in portraiture and pastel. And I fell in love with it. I, I loved it then. And when 20 years later, I was able to start in art, I did not see any reason to change. I also felt that at the age I was, uh, I should try to, I should stick with one thing. and. Pastel is just so beautiful. Why go anywhere else? And so, had you been aware of pastel prior to that um, that that first lesson? Do you paid much attention to it? It had drawn you before. It was just sheer happenstance that uh, you came upon pastel. I had no knowledge of art or pastel or anything. Uh, no, pastel at that time. This was 1971, maybe. Pastel was not well known. It wasn't in high use. So this was all very new to me. Excellent. It was made, I, I don't remember now whether it was a four week class, a six week class, um, but that's all I had. And then as life happens, I put it away for 20 something years. Well, let's um, look then first, as I'm always want to do, um, and, and look at the consistency of the work. Um, and I feel like it's been long enough um, since we started these sessions, um, and I, I gave a brief explanation of why I feel consistency is so important, why we always start the conversation there. I thought it would uh, merit just a quick review of what I mean when I'm talking about consistency. Um, and, and why it's so important. And, and um, so, so first, when um, I'm looking at an artist's work, whether it be someone I'm considering bringing into the gallery or if it's an artist that I'm advising and trying to help them get gallery representation or increase their sales, um, you know, be it through galleries or shows, one of the first areas that we go to is consistency. And the, the reason that um, I have found that to be so important over the years is that when it comes to displaying an artist's work um, and creating an experience for a potential collector who's going to come into my gallery space or encounter the work at a show, um, we really want to create a powerful impression of the work. We want it to stop the um, potential collector in their tracks if we can, um, and really capture their uh, imagination and draw them in and, and invite them to explore the work. And so um, I have found that um, it's important to display a number of pieces by an artist and that the more consistent that work is, um, the more likely it is to have that effect. Now, um, whenever I talk about consistency and, and start talking about this effect that we're trying to create, I get a lot of um, feedback from uh, readers on the blog or participants in, in this session that, well, I, I understand consistency is important, but I, I'm nervous about becoming uh, homogenous in my work or um, you know, feeling trapped or pigeonholed into one particular style or, or direction with my work. And, and I think it's important to, to point out that when I'm talking about consistency, I'm not talking about, um, uh, you know, robot-like slavish devotion to recreating the same piece of artwork over and over again. Um, and in fact, um, you know, that would have its own negative consequences. But instead, what we're talking about is creating a, a consistency of effect where, um, each work can kind of naturally lead into the next piece where someone who's encountering the work can feel that there is a common thread through that work that even through its um, variety still helps bring it all together and tie it all together. And so, um, as I mentioned in our first online critique group session, when I'm looking at the um, consistency of the work, I'm looking at these kind of six key areas, um, the subject matter, 
the thematic elements of the work, um, the style, uh, the palette, the medium, and the presentation. And as long as I have um, four out of these six to tie the work together, or even if I were to have three that very strongly tie it together, and then um, the other three maybe loosely, I can feel that the work is consistent. And so um, that allows then for some latitude for an artist to um, have some variety. If the subject matter theme and style are very consistent, then the palette and medium can vary. Um, or conversely, if the, the medium palette and style are, are consistent and the thematic elements have some consistency, the subject matter can vary. And so it gives the artist um, uh, room to, to move and breathe and grow and evolve um, over time. And so um, that's what we're looking for as, as we, and what we'll be reviewing here as we look at Carolyn's work is, does this work um, strike me and, and give the impression that it was all done by one artistic mind and one artistic hand. Um, as I'm looking at this work, can I feel that, um, th that purpose behind it and that presence? Um, and, and like I say, we'll kind of explore how that works um, with Carolyn's work. And then in all these sessions, that's what we're looking for when we talk about consistency. Um, and so I'm going to invite, um, we're going to relook at these five images, thinking about those six criteria. And I'm going to invite um, uh, our video panel, those of you who've joined us by video, to be the first to give us some response and your thoughts on the consistency of um, Carolyn's work. Um, and and uh, let, hold on here, let me see if I can get a few more of you in. Here we go. Okay. Um, and so we've got these five pieces, Oop, hold on, there we go. And again, thinking of those elements, how does the work strike you in terms of its consistency? And, and so what I'd like to look for is what are the elements that do tie it together? And what are the things that you feel um, maybe uh, uh, cause some, some deviation from the consistency of the work? And so we've got those five pieces in, and it uh, looks like Connie, I've got you and, and anyone else who wants to hop in. Let me start with Connie and I think you can unmute. Oh, I've got you unmuted. Good morning, Connie. How do you feel about the consistency of Carolyn's work? I th think it's extremely consistent um, and yet it isn't one note. I think she's very successful in uh, changing your viewpoint with each one and yet the eyes draw you and she's managed to make, you know, a completely different world for each one. I think that's quite an achievement. Um, pastels are lovely colors and the softness, but she's managed to make them feel very um, assertive. Let's put it that way. It's like they are, they're just um, complete little worlds. I think that's very nice. Uh, the colors are great. The style is, a little varied from one to another. It looks like they've evolved a little bit from one end of this, you know, over the years, which is nice to know. And um, they, um, I think the faces are truly amazing. So well done. Yeah, and um, as as you look at these five pieces and it's hard with a limited sampling of, of five pieces do you feel like if you were to encounter them in a gallery space or a show that you could easily recognize them as having been done by one artist? I think so. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact, looking at them again as you're going through, is the backgrounds are as much a, an important part of her di uh, design as the image that she wants you to focus. So it means that the entire um, surface is involved. And I think uh, that's really nice to see. I think she, this one is maybe the least in, um, in sync with the others, but I think that's partly the coloration, which is one, just one aspect. But um, yeah, I think you would recognize her work, especially the eyes and the faces, which are quite amazing. Yeah, and um, excellent. And and anyone else from the, the video panel want to hop in? I've got a, let me bring someone over and I don't have a name here, but let's see if I can get, I, I think I have feedback from someone else in the attendees. Good morning, do I have you? 
Uh, looks like I do not have video there. Let me try to get uh, Karen. And Karen, do I have you? Well, it seems like I am uh, not getting audio from our other attendees. Well, We're not in his panels. Oh, there we go. Karen, do I have you? I think so. There we go. Gotcha. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think uh, she's very consistent on many aspects. Of course, the subject matter is all the same. There, like she was saying, the, the theme, it has to do with everything, with the eyes and how that changes with the thoughts and whatever uh, uh, that the person is thinking about. Um, and of course, um, the medium that she uses also makes it consistent. Um, I like the looseness of the area around the face. Um, I like uh, the way it's integrated with uh, the clothing and and the different, uh, like the hair. And it, it does a wonderful job of having um, hard lines and soft lines. It's, it's uh, really, really excellent. Um, I was wondering, does she use models? Yeah, Carolyn, that's a great question. Um, do you use models? And, and kind of following up on that, um, how do you develop your compositions? Do you come into each piece with an idea of what you want to achieve and, and then kind of create the composition around that? Or do your models suggest the composition? Talk to us a little bit about process. Well, the process about, well, August will be my third year into a series of paintings with one model doing all of, uh, doing the model, being the model for all of the paintings. I have about 32 paintings of her now. They, Our Song is one, Waiting for Diego is one, and uh, Elusive Dreams. Those three are all the same woman. Um, we started out with the idea of uh, doing poses that were inspired by vintage Hollywood actresses. But over time, and with the idea that this would become a solo exhibition, uh, over time, um, it evolved into, rather than these actresses and these uh, formal poses, it evolved into uh, emotions. And Karen was such a superb model that everything we did, I could have painted any, any one of the photos that we took in, in our photo session. For instance, this Our Song, we had a photo session that had lasted about three hours. We were doing Coco Chanel. At the end of that, we were both extremely tired and I told her about the idea I had I had, had about painting the storyline or the narrative from country and Western music. And she said, wait, wait a minute, let's just, uh, so she put a song by Patsy Cline on her phone and said, start taking pictures. So in about five minutes, I took a half dozen pictures she was crying spontaneously by listening to that song. And those became, that, that became the best painting out of that three hour session. Um, and it was, it was random at that time. She wasn't being anybody else. She was being herself. And uh, we, we just were able to get a connection between the two of us that lets me paint, see, feel that emotion that she's, that she's portraying. Um, so, so, for so if I could jump in for just a second, yeah. I think that's a great illustration, um, kind of jumping back to talk about consistency. Um, you know, sometimes the question will come up, okay, great, Jason, what's the difference between my subject matter and my theme in my work? Um, and I think what you're just describing is a good illustration of that. You know, the subject matter here is the figure um, and, and um, you know, with an abstracted background. And, and so we see that through the work. 
but but the theme kind of sits behind that and and you mentioned it kind of the emotion of of these figures that's really kind of your focus um and drives the the composition and drives the the subject matter as well and so um you know in your own work i think it can be helpful to, to kind of take it apart and deconstruct a little bit okay I have my subject, I know what my subject is, but what is the broader thematic, um, uh, you know, element that I, or, or that I'm trying to emphasize in this work. And that can work for a, a figurative artist. It can work for a, a landscape painter, an abstract artist, kind of thinking what it is that uh, drives um, your interest in that subject and, and what, um, what emotional elements or what kind of reaction you're trying to evoke. That can be the broader thematic, um, uh, driver behind the work. Um, any other comments on consistency or additional feedback? Um, now having heard a little bit more about the work, um, and I'll throw that out to the panel first. Okay, let's let's jump in and talk. Um, uh, that's interesting that I've got this comment here. Um, so this this comment comes from Lisa and. Um, uh, t talking kind of inconsistency and, and uh, Lisa says the mark making quality of light and the medium all tell me that this is from the same artist. However, I see different approaches to the figure that I think are challenging the consistency to your overall body of work. It may be worth considering creating a series of works that are more closely related. I'd like to see your voice carried through one particular approach because it would help me better understand what it is you love about the figure. Um, the same figure in multiple poses, perhaps at different ages or in different clothes, but on the same paper and the same color palette um, is just one example. And of course, um, it, well, Carolyn, let me take your response to that. Um, does that resonate with you? Does that um, kind of sit in line with what you think about your work? It actually does. Uh, and, and I recognize exactly what she's saying. I know that. In fact, it's, <laughs> it's one of the things that is keeping me from getting a signature status in the Pastel Society of, of America because each one is slightly different. And that is, I think that's because it's based on my reaction to what I'm seeing. I can't make the background the same. I can't make the colors the same the feeling that I'm trying to, to portray in my painting determines everything else. So if that means that I need to try a different approach, uh, a different kind of uh, color palette, that's what I'm going to do there. And the other thing is I like the challenge of trying something new, um, of saying, well, this is what I want to do in this painting, so how can I achieve it in pastel? Maybe I've seen somebody in oil painting do a particular kind of background. Great can effect. I do this in pastel? I've never seen it before, but I bet I can, I, I bet I can experiment and find a way to do it with pastel. So yes, they're probably all going to be different. E even as you see in, in the three paintings, here of the five that are all the same woman, uh, you don't, when you see them on the wall in, in, in the exhibition, you will not recognize that they're the same woman. That's, that's just going to be a part of who I am. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, <laughs> Th th this we can get tripped up in the, this idea of consistency. Um, I, I certainly um, w what what Linda's saying. I, I do that does resonate that there could be an opportunity. Um, and and the one I'm thinking of specifically um, this piece. I could imagine a series where you take that same figure and and costume and and create different poses and have three or four different pieces um, with with similar background and and um, you know the same same costume and and create a very effective um, uh, you know even tighter more consistent grouping of of that piece. I think that's kind of what's being suggested is that um, you know there could be some more. Uh, more exploration of each of the subjects and compositions that you're creating. And, and certainly that could create some, some interesting effects. But um, as a gallery owner, if I were putting together a, a, a display of your works, 
Um, even these five pieces, I just don't feel that <clears throat> I would have a real problem um, showing them together um, because of those elements that we already talked about and that, that Connie mentioned that, um, you know, the, the, the underlying theme and, and the, the fact that they're all pastel, um, certainly presentation could come into play as well in terms of the, the framing and, and the, the way the work is presented. But um, th they're close, close enough together that I don't feel you have to explore a more tightly um, repetitive um, imagery than, than what we're seeing here. I think that um, um, you, you've got the latitude to do exactly what you're talking about. But at the same time, if you were to explore doing uh, more repetitious images, there would be room for that as well. Um, and so you've got, I, I think, latitude that way. I've got to mention the piece that I have right, right up right now, um, it, several of the commenters uh, felt like this um, had the feeling of a self-portrait. And it sounds like, no, that's not the case, um, but, but there's something introspective about this one. And I've just got to say that the effect that you achieved with the hands against the glass really caught my imagination and my attention. Um, you, you know, creating glass in artwork is, is not easy in the first place. And, and this effect of those hands against the glass, I think is very, very powerful um, and very well executed. And so I just had to throw that, uh, that mention in there. Let's jump in and um, talk a little bit then about the presentation. Um, framing. Talk about your approach to framing the work. This one that we're seeing here um, has a little bit more of a contemporary feel in that it's not set off with a, a mat or, or, or kind of a traditional presentation that way. Talk about your approach to framing. The framing that I use, I do not use mats anymore. Uh, I, I, with pastel now, we have the choice of using spacers, these plastic spacers that go between the glass and the painting. And it eliminates the need for a mat and gives you space, breathing air between, between the two. Um, so I, I do not use mats anymore. It gives it more contemporary look. Um, in fact, when you see my paintings in person and you can see the texture uh, that's in the paintings, Many times, uh, one, go backwards for a moment. I also frame um, with non-glare glass. So um, when you look at my paintings in person, you may have the impression that you're looking at an oil painting because there's texture in there. Um, some of the final strokes are done with very heavy hand to give you some um, impasto kind of effects. Um, the different colors, um, in some cases, I blend them together um, uh, visually, but not touching. I, I don't usually touch my paintings. It's the blending is done with a pastel stroke itself. Um, the framing itself, I when we when I did the first solo exhibition of the women, um, I wanted all of the frames to be alike to have it a very consistent feel. So it's not this frame; it's another one that it's very subtle. Um, you can't say that it's modern or traditional or anything else. It just kind of blends into the background and lets the painting itself show. But now that I have seen uh, frame, <clears throat> frame this painting with this black, I really like it. So I think that that's what I'll be using in my future paintings. And we got uh, just a, 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 um, a feedback on that frame. Uh, Edna says, in regard to presentation, I like the simple frames that don't detract from the images. Um, I'm assuming that you frame your work in similar manner, which gives it a nice cohesiveness. Um, and I don't know if I had, I did have some other feedback from other um, artists who said, I don't care for the framing as much. I'd like to see Matt and something more traditional. And, and I think this is one of the constant challenges that you run into in framing your work is that, um, you know, every person is gonna respond to it a little bit differently. 
Um, and, and some folks do want to have a more traditional, um, you know, and, and with pastel, there, there's almost this kind of expectation of what a pastel looks like framed. I think that you create um, some interest by approaching it differently and by creating a, a more contemporary look. Uh, I also tend to lean towards liking and preferring simplicity and allowing the, the work to be the focal point rather than, than uh, you know, an ornate frame or something of that nature. Yeah. And so I respond, respond well to this, but we always have to be prepared. Um, and I, as I'm working with clients who are looking at work, it, it is a frequent conversation that we're having about presentation. And um, there are times when I will let a client know I work with a great framer, and if this frame doesn't work for you, we can can work with the framer to find something that, well, it can be adjusted and changed as the client needs. But I do think that um, your work is strengthened by using a consistent presentation across the work. Now, the other area that I want to talk about is pricing. And interestingly, um, those of you who've watched past sessions know that the, uh, the, the refrain that we constantly hear is that, um, oh, it seems like your prices are low, your prices are low. We got the opposite response to your pricing, Carolyn, and I want to talk about that. Connie is an example of that. She says the pricing seems really high, but perhaps the market she sells in is compatible with her pricing. So Carolyn, talk about how you arrived at uh, the pricing for the work. We're looking at a 16 by 16 here that you've got priced at uh, 2,500. How did you arrive at your pricing structure? I, I did a bit of research. I looked at other artists that, whose work I admire and worked with figurative and portrait. And what were they charging? What was uh, their general pricing? From there, I decided that regardless of how I felt about a painting or how much time I had put into a painting, each size would be priced the same. So for instance, a 12 by 16, which is one of my favorite uh, sizes to work on is 2,500 across the board. And 18 by 24 is um, 3,300. The other advantage it gives me for that is that I do commissioned portraits and that lets me set the tone and the scale for my commissioned portrait. If I were to go lower on these, then how would that affect the commissions that I'm asked to do? And, and Carolyn, this would make you the poster artist in my book for an approach to pricing um, in several different ways. Um, number one is I, you know, I am constantly encouraging artists to think about looking at the market when they're setting their prices. It is very easy to become um, a bit myopic about pricing by looking at other artists in your neighborhood, um, you know, in, in the groups that you're participating in or local shows that you're going into um, and, and to kind of get, get caught in a, a pricing structure that is, I think, um, consistently undervaluing the, the work that's being created. And so it, I, I do agree. It's better to go out and look at the marketplace and look at the artists who, with whom you would like to be competing, um, you know, with whom you'd like to be showing your work and, and um, be ambitious and, and uh, pushing up. And then the other thing I would say is that um, very often um, we, we kind of uh, let the, the let the market, so to speak, set our prices. Again, thinking if I'm showing in my little town or um, in my group of artists, I've got to be priced competitively with these artists. But um, Carolyn, what you're describing by setting your prices where you have, um, it, it drives you in a different direction in terms of where you'll be looking to market and promote and show and sell your your pieces. Um, and it, it's very easy for an artist to get caught in a, um, you know, kind of a, a low price cycle, uh, you know, especially if you begin to sell some of your work at lower prices, you just start to feel this, this kind of gravity um, that, that, that can get in the way of uh, or can prevent you from moving your prices to where you would like them to be. Um, and, and so, um, yes, we've got to be, you know, obviously, um, Carolyn, you're not pricing uh, 24 by 18 at $33,000. Um, 
you, you know, there, there are going to be some, some ranges within which we need to, to, to work, but, um, you know, there are galleries and shows out there that command these higher prices. And so by setting your prices in that range, um, y- you almost qualify yourself to then go out and start talking to those venues for showing and selling your work. Um, you know, rather than thinking of it the other way around, when will I be worthy to have those prices? You set your prices there and then then can go out and, and market. Um, and, and talk about uh, sales, Carolyn. Do you have, have you had the opportunity to show in venues where these price points have been accepted by clients and purchases have been made? Um, do you have a good collector base for your work? The, the collector base is mostly in commissions. Um, not a not a lot of sales in the uh, for the work that's already presented. The this this series of paintings has been in um, three ex, three solo exhibitions so far. Only one sale from that. So uh, the the other avenue I have for sales is um, last December I had an end of the year holiday sale. Um, where (laughs) sometimes I paint a landscape as kind of a vacation away from having to get a portrait so right. And with a landscape, there's a little bit more leeway. So I use those as my kind of loose things to do. And uh, I offer them those at a holiday sale prices and 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 sold about 12 of those. That was was easy to do. It's... um, the, the figurative market is a, is a little bit tougher for me. Good. Yeah, let's let's talk about that just a little bit briefly. And we are running out of time, but I, I did want to, to have that discussion because, um, you know, as a gallery owner, um, I, I certainly have, have shown and sold figurative pieces over the years. And, and there's an interesting distinction, isn't there, between figurative work and portraiture. Um, and sometimes the the line between those two can present a little bit of a challenge. I can tell you that in the gallery, when I'm showing um, figurative work, um, uh, if if the work feels like it's too much about the person, in other words, if it feels more like a portrait than a figure, it becomes very difficult to sell. Um, you know, clients will look at it and say, "Oh, that's beautiful. It's very well done. Who is that?" Um, and when it becomes a question of who is it, um, that, that becomes more of a challenge. And, and so as I look at uh, your pieces, let me just flip through a few here. Um, these, you know, the pieces that have the abstracted backgrounds and, and the, the, the stronger gestures, from my experience, those would be a little bit easier for me to sell. Um, this piece, for example, um, uh, the, the title of the piece evokes an interesting story. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, more about the, the gesture and, and um, you know, the costume that she's wearing. It's going to bring an interesting conversation. Um, this would be easier for me to sell, I think, than a piece like this that does feel like it's a little bit more about the person. Although um, that's not to say that you couldn't sell work like this. And I have collectors um, who have built entire collections around um borderline portrait work um, and, and are very interested in it. And so remember, the art market is very broad and there are buyers out there for just about everything that you could imagine. But, but when we think about kind of stacking the odds in our favor, the more the work can be about the emotion or the gesture or um, y- y- you know, the movement or the story and less about the, the specific person the better we're going to be able to to market and promote and and sell that work. Um, I do want to jump into some of the comments that came in. This from Claudia said, I was drawn to these portraits, but I think I wanted more story or context. Um, Possibly you might add props as in the excellent self-portrait. Here's an example where it was thought that 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 piece was a self-portrait. At Lens Context, it was my favorite. The whole idea of working in series is great. These women will hang together well. Uh, pun intended. Um, And Corey says, I would focus on fading the background more into the background. Uh, Waiting for Diego has the most appropriate background. In many instances, the background takes away from the strength of your work. Um, The background in Odile's deceit takes away from the stunning exquisite figure in this painting. I would love to see this 
uh, with a more subdued background. Um, this is an interesting question because we've already talked a little bit about this and there were, we've made some positive comments about the background. Talk about um, the challenges of creating a figurative piece and, and a background behind it that doesn't distract from the, the subject. What a difficult thing that is. Um, if you give me the face, the eyes, I have no problem. I don't even think about, worry about doing that. When it comes to the background though, that is a, a, it's a tough decision and it's tough to get it right. Um, sometimes I decide on what to do based on what the figure is doing or sometimes it's based on simply what I see. But if I'm working from a photograph, what I see is usually too much. It has to be simplified. A lot of it has to be taken away. Abstracted um, away. I, if, if it were given my choice, I would just use a gradated simple color background, a lot like I did in Waiting for Diego or in our song. That's the kind of that I enjoy doing that. Um, but sometimes I feel like the, the, the person, the subject has to have a story behind them. And if that's what I've decided to do, then I have to put it there. It has to belong there. It has to be with them when I do the painting. And the background is, is not, um, to me, not separate. I, I do the whole painting at the same time. It's not something I go back in and add later. Yeah. Well, um, it's, uh, and, and we are out of time, I, I, but I want to thank you, Carolyn, for um, agreeing to uh, sit mm -hmm. in the hot seat and give us the opportunity to look at your work um, and, and learn a bit, a little bit of the background um, and, and um, share some insights about the work. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love doing this and I look forward to watching it again and see what everybody was saying. Yeah, excellent. Um, the, the one last thing I thought I would just mention to, um, you, you know, in last week's session, a, a question came up about, okay, what is it that um, drives someone to make a purchase of an artwork? You know, what element is it in that artwork that is drawing them in and you know, getting them to the point that they're ready to purchase. And um, I mentioned some of the things that if there's something unique about the work or something that uh, uh, resonates emotionally with a collector, that will often do it. Um, it can also be a question of having the right space and this piece feeling like it fits into that space. One thing I didn't mention though, and I think that's relevant to Carolyn's work is that, um, so often, especially if you have a collector of a certain medium um, and, and with pastels and water media, watercolors or gouache or other media like that, um, we, we will sometimes see collectors who just become um, uh, enthralled with a particular medium. And what they're responding to often is a mastery of that medium. Um, and I think in looking at Carolyn's work, I can, can safely say that we would find collectors uh, of that nature who'd be very interested wow. in your work. There's a, a very strong execution of, of the pastel there. And, and by the way, I have to throw my, myself and my wife Carrie into this. We've collected a number of pastels because we just love the effect that you can achieve with a pastel that you can't get in any other medium. Um, and, and so, um, you know, obviously there are many other reasons that people buy, but mastery of your medium can also become one of them. And I think Carolyn, you, you're, you're doing some great work in, in that regard as well and would, would find um, interested collectors there. Um, again, thank you for, for joining us for this session, everyone. We will be back here um, next Wednesday with another online critique group. I hope you all have a great week. We'll see you then. Take care. Thank you.